So before I came to DMAC, I had been at computers and writing. I was at home just long enough to do some laundry, shake my fist at my overly loud downstairs neighbor, and get myself on two terror-inducing flights on planes approximately the size of a golf cart twice because you have to fly to Cincinnati before you can fly to Columbus. I came to OSU's campus, which I love because there are no highways running through it, unlike Michigan State, but that's besides the point. And somewhere during the halcyon first days of DMAC, I decided to take a stroll down High Street to see what there was to eat. One of the first places I saw was La Bamba, which claimed to be authentic Mexican food. Now, the word authentic kind of drives me crazy because people use it against me and people I love and because the word authentic is often in front of the word food. Authentic Mexican food, authentic Chinese food, authentic Ethiopian food, authentic Indian food, authentic Thai food. Have you ever had authentic Thai food? No, of course you haven't, because if you had, your head would have knighted in the flame, your blood type would have turned to napalm, people would have stood around you roasting marshmallows and playing guitar on a beach while you would have been thinking, I wish I hadn't tried to extend my well-intentioned feeling towards other ethnicities to my food choices. Anyway, the sign for La Bamba had the icons of a palm tree and a guitar next to it, just in case I'd forgotten that La Bamba is a Mexican reference. Never mind that Richie Valens, the man that made the song by popular was from Los Angeles, and maybe I'm just jumping to conclusions that Mariachi's palm trees and the song La Bamba are what people in Ohio think of LA instead of never-ending traffic, the worst airport in the world, and overpriced cocktail. But right next to this sign is a sign in screaming neon that says, burritos as big as your head, and I wonder about people roaming around the streets of Columbus, wait, I'm sorry, I mean Chihuahua, which is a state in Mexico, not just a Paris Hilton fashion accessory, trying to carry food as big as their head, which of course means that things become very hard to do, hard to shake people's hands, hard to drive, I mean, life becomes difficult when you have a burrito the size of your head. For people in Canada, I mean Chihuahua. So I stroll away, and already I'm confused by all the design and semiotic signals this one place is sending my way. And not a block away, there is Jimmy Guaco's Border Town Burrito, which sends me into a tizzy because Jimmy apparently hasn't changed his clothes since the Mexican Revolution of May the 5th, 1917, or as it's commonly known in the U.S., brought to you by Cuervo and Corona Day. And that's bad enough, but under the sign it states that Senor Jimmy specializes in Border Town Burritos, and I think to myself, well, hell, whose border are we talking about here? Is Columbus near a border? I thought Columbus was in the middle of Ohio, but sometimes I get Midwest geography confused. Is this some sort of Ohio Kentucky? border where people fight over a truly tasty nature of how to make the perfect burrito? And then it occurs to me they're talking about some other border. Jimmy Guaco is talking about the border between Mexico and the U.S., which traditionally has kept getting bigger on the U.S. side. Then Jimmy Guaco's name starts to make sense to me. See, his name is a split between a traditionally gringo name like Jimmy with flag waving and eagle screaming and Guaco, which ends in O, and therefore, unlike Ohio, means he's part Mexican. Well, that along with the sombrero and the poncho clearly delineates that the border town that Jimmy's burritos come from is the same sort of border town that existed between the U.S. and Mexico go from the years 1836 to 1853 because Jimmy hasn't changed his outfit since then. And I find another authentic Mexican food place, again in green, white, and red colors, to declare that it too is authentic and filled with chili peppers and sunglasses that are ready to party. And none of this makes any sense to me because I don't judge a burrito place by the color of their font, but by the content of their burrito. And I don't want a burrito as big as my head with cheese and sour cream on it. Not because that's culturally inappropriate or less authentic, but because sour cream is sick and wrong and doesn't belong on anything. And I think about Stuart Hall's discussion about how colonized people trade on racism because that's the best cultural capital they have, or Benilla Silva's talking about how racism ha can happen without racists, and David Spur and Victor Villanueva's work with rhetoric of colonialism and racism. You know, Villanueva came to Michigan State, and aside from constantly fighting the urge to fall down to my knees and scream, you're my effing hero, and then faint like some sort of prepubescent 1960s Beatles fan, one of the things I did was hear him speak. And what he talked about was about how colonialism produced a rhetoric of racism that we see today, because you had to develop a rhetoric that dehumanized people with language and arguments in order to do really nasty things to them, like give them smallpox-infected blankets, or clap them in irons, take them across the ocean, and try and sell them to people, or just throw them overboard for the insurance money. So rhetoric gives you a good lens for examining how people continue to be made into something a little less than human through language and other semiotic systems. So you can do things like politely liberate the country for going on six years, and do a bang-up job ignoring an entire city drowning because it's their fault for not leaving. For example, keeping palm trees, ponchos, and sombreros of 1838 to 1917 associated with Mexican, you don't have to deal with the actual people that are in front of you, and you can make all sorts of cultural shortcuts it's like thinking to be Mexican, you have to have a big mustache, a bandolier, and speak Spanish. And if these people don't do these things, they must not be Mexican or Latino. And therefore, your burrito, one assumes, will be worthless angle fight chicken wrap. What's the difference between a burrito and a chicken wrap? I have no idea. At this point, you might be asking yourself, well, this is all nice and good, but what does that have to do with new media? You see, new media is all about design, designing information, designing shots, designing web pages, designing tools and media that do a certain kind of work. And that work is what the designer wants it to do. Well, authentic as a visual design trope works by placing one thing next to each other, what we call in rhetoric parataxis. So burritos plus pictures of banditos plus green, white, and red equals authentic burrito, and the trope becomes invisible at a certain point. One of the affordances of new media is that you can disrupt parataxis by easily remixing images and placing them next to other images. 
images that point out how the first trope worked rhetorically. That's great and fun and maybe even a little funny. If things like the authentic trope can be disrupted, resisted, and remixed into demi-humorous animated arguments or a quasi-academic piece of new media that remixes those terrible, sneaky, and tacit racist tropes easily by relying on the very foundation of new parataxis like structures and the affordances of delivery and remixing, great, okay, I'm all on board, max and flip cameras for everybody. If, on the other hand, new media is used to replicate the same old racist tropes in new dynamic ways, well, bollocks to that. If we use a new media to replicate old designs of oppression and undervalue what people bring to the table by opening up institutional space just wide enough to get new toys, but do not go about actively sharing those toys or reproduce racist tropes like the ones I've described here, then I have had enough of authentic to last me the rest of my life. I don't need a new way to see it, and I can resist those things in the same way I've always resisted them and other racist technologies that were rammed down my throat, like graduate admission forms that made me put only one type of ethnicity or English-only education. Bada bai la la bam ba Bada bai la la bam ba Se necesita una poca de gracia